This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, University of Mary Washington professor Christine Henry talks about the history of 20th century roadside attractions and her own experience traveling to the Blue Hole, a freshwater pond in Ohio. Good morning. For those watching today's lecture, my name is Michael Spencer, current chair of the Department of Historic Preservation here at the University of Mary Washington as well as instructor for this freshman seminar course. See the USA, the history of road tripping in American culture. Today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Henry, an assistant professor in the Department of Historic Preservation, as well as the original designer for the course. Professor Henry holds a BA from the University of William and Mary, an MARC degree from Catholic University, and both an MHP and PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park. Her research interests focus on the concept of placemaking as well as social justice issues within the discipline of historic preservation. In addition, Professor Henry is forever a student of vernacular architecture, including roadside architecture, which dovetails nicely with this class as well as today's lecture entitled, They Move the Blue Hole, Tales of an Ohio Roadside Icon. Welcome, Professor Henry. Thank you very much, Professor Spencer. Good morning, everyone. It is really great to see you. Thank you so much. So this is what I think of when I think of a road trip, right? The open road. Now, you all all semester have been studying all kinds of themes of the freedom of the road, of who is allowed to travel when and where, um, travel as a process rather than a destination the mythology of the car in American society, and roadside architecture in the 20th century. So today what I'm going to tell you is a story that ties a lot of those themes together. This morning, it's going to be about a quest to find a magical piece of a place I remember from my childhood. The story begins in the 1990s when I had the opportunity to travel to Ohio on business. And I thought I could see if I could find my favorite roadside attraction, the Blue Hole. Now, like the back of this postcard says, it's six miles west of Sandusky, Ohio, on Route 101. The depth of the hole is unknown. The visible depth is apparently 50 to 60 feet. It finds its source in an underground river and maintains a temperature of 48 degrees winter and summer. It's not affected by floods or drought. The volume of water flowing from this marvelous spring is 7 million gallons a day, sufficient to supply a city of 75,000 people. Really, a hole that uh, filled with water where you can't see the bottom seems pretty magical to me. But I suppose this story actually begins a little bit earlier, in the 1970s when I was a kid, when road trips for me were not about the freedom of the open road and the romantic notion of going anywhere at any time. They were instead about long hours in the back of the Plymouth with my brother. We were traveling to the upper Midwest to Ohio and Michigan to see grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles and sit in lawn chairs and picnic and all sorts of salads, none of which involved anything green. So the Blue Hole to me is all part of this story of the upper Midwest. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, so how did you hear about the Blue Hole as a child, considering in your article you say 20 years later many Ohio natives didn't even know about it? That's a great question. Well, my parents introduced us to road tripping early. And I'm not really sure whether it was just to keep us from fighting in the back seat or to keep us entertained, but at every stop we were allowed to pick up as many of those great brochures as we possibly could and then we were each allowed to choose one amazing attraction that we could stop on. And on these trips, my brother and I, we would go back and forth on, on what we wanted to come and see. But ultimately, to everyone's dismay, I actually always requested the same place. 
I always wanted to go back to see the blue hole. As this brochure shows you, um, they had everything, right? There was play equipment, they had a museum exhibit, they had an, a big water wheel, and of course, they have a hole in the ground. I mean, what's not to like about a pool of water that is so clear that you could stare into it forever? And I could let my imagination run wild. The formations, to me, were better than clouds. On the back of this postcard, they say, the most extraordinary artesian spring on the continent. That's quite a claim. In the clear depths of the apparently motionless water, the visitor sees a myriad of strange formations varying from the flowing white beard of hoary-haired giants to the rich blue snow-covered Alps. Well, that's quite an imagination. This magic place is located only six miles west of Sandusky, Ohio, on State Route 101 and Federal Route 6, more beautiful at night than during the daytime. So when I had my opportunity to travel back to Ohio as an adult, I talked with a few of my friends to find out about this place. Interestingly, a few of them had no idea what I was talking about. And then one person finally said, oh yeah, but I heard they filled it in. And another person said, oh, I heard they moved it. They what? I mean, really, how do you even do that? I knew if you can't see the bottom, you can't fill it in. The postcards told me that. The depth is unknown. And really, how do you move a hole, even one that's magical? So this started me on research, right? I had to find the truth. And this quest actually lasted many years as I tried to figure out how in the world this very famous attraction had somehow gotten wiped off the map. I had to get to the bottom of the mystery. Well, the history is actually kind of interesting. So the Blue Hole starts in the 19th century in a small town on the banks of Lake Erie in a town called Castalia. It's actually named for an ancient Greek nymph who Apollo turned into the fountain at Delphi. So it's all about the water. Castalia always knew that the water was really important to its identity. And this really quick and clear running stream that was um, fed by artesian, artesian waters that were coming from glacial deposits ran right through the center of town. And the townspeople in the 19th century thought, this is going to power our industry. This is going to push us in to the 19th century, running our mills and doing all kinds of wonderful things. So we're going to put a dam across this, this spring. The problem was that all the rock over top of it was way too fragile, and the pressure caused collapse, and there were sinkholes all over town. But early fishermen saw the potential in such a swift stream. The cold water was perfect for trout, and it moved at a rate of 5,000 gallons a minute with that constant 48 degree temperature. Because it came up from so far below the surface, there was no air in the water. So they created small waterfalls near these holes. And then they stocked the stream with trout. Trout is not a native species, but it's one that loves really cold water and one that fishermen really love to catch. So as they are creating their own little private getaways in these um, little small parts of the woods all around town, the secrets get out. Townspeople at first sneak through the fences, walk through the woods just to see these magical blue holes, and then eventually they tell their friends, and people start coming from far and wide. But not really too much until, yes, the car, of course. They were open secrets, but then, once people had the opportunity to come from far away and see many things and just stop at these um, blue holes as from one point to another, it became a crowd. It was a bit 
um, a bit uh, scary, I think, for those fishermen to see all of these visitors. And at first, they thought about trying to keep them out, trying to shut them out, building higher fences. But the populations of Cleveland and Toledo were so big that they thought, maybe, instead, we should just invite them in. So the private clubs decided to open up their waters. And they developed a little mythology around the bottomless spring to lure people um, in from the roads, from those state routes and federal routes, people passing by. And so you can start to see that it's, it's evolved from just this stream with a few rocks to make a waterfall. Suddenly it looks like an attraction. This looks like a place that they're welcoming you in. It has this nice uh, fence around the edges and a pathway. They're really trying to encourage people to come and visit. And this continues for a while. They're always upgrading and always trying to make it more interesting. They include a couple of these little um, step ups so that you can peer further down into the water. As the popularity of the Blue Hole grew, all of the tourist infrastructure started to grow around it. People had expectations. They knew what you should find at a roadside attraction. One of the things they started with early on was building an incredible garden all the way around the Blue Hole. In the Midwest, they have pretty rough winters, so when summer comes around and things are blooming, everybody wants to see gardens. It really doesn't have anything to do with the Blue Hole, but they knew people would enjoy it. And they put in areas for picnicking. That's really when it becomes a bona fide roadside attraction, right? Come and stay the afternoon, have your lunch, and wander around the gardens. But admission is only so much, so don't forget the gift shop. I'm not really sure why they chose a log cabin. It has been a very long time since Ohio was considered a frontier but this was their gift shop for quite a long time. And it was well stocked. They had absolutely every tchotchke that you can imagine to commemorate your visit to the Blue Hole. Salt and pepper shakers are my favorite. I'm not sure why I don't really associate salt and pepper with going to see a roadside attraction, but you can always find them. And it continued to grow. As I said, it was a stocked pond that these fishermen had, and they had to continue to stock their pond in order to, um, to keep fishing this, um, this little pond, and so they created a hatchery. And the hatchery itself became its own attraction, as you can see. Um, the captive farmed fish that were at the hatchery, you could feed them for a quarter that you put into a gumball machine with little kibble and watch them kind of all jump around in the water. They were pretty excited. And then, of course, you can see the big water wheel. So no more little um, waterfalls to keep it aerated. Um, they have this huge, big water wheel, which I'm honestly not so sure does much more than the waterfalls, but it makes a much better Kodak moment. Because when you have a roadside attraction, you want to make sure, even well before Instagram, that people capture it in pictures. And then they share it with their friends so that they come back. As one of those postcards said, it's better at night. I don't know if it's better, but they did actually build some infrastructure to make sure that you would come back just to check it out and see. Uh, so you can see in this image, it has that rustic fence all the way around the edges, but in the center, there's this quiet little, little lily pad just floating in the middle. Well, that is no accident. That is an artificial lily pad with down lighting so that you can make sure to see those formations at night. And clearly, it was a place that was pretty good for a romantic stroll because you can see the couple on the edge trying to enjoy it. But the glory days of the Blue Hole did not last forever, which I suppose is no surprise. As often happens, the interest in these magical waters waned, and eventually the gate is shut forever in 1990. They honestly just couldn't keep up with all of the other attractions that are in the area. This part of 
Ohio, right on the shores of Lake Erie, is actually called Ohio's vacation land. And people come for the beaches, and they come for all sorts of attractions. And the Blue Hole was maybe just a little too quaint and a little too quiet. I like to show this because I think the, um, the postcards don't quite do it justice. The gate that they have to enter the Blue Hole is actually made out of the local limestone rock that collapsed in order to make the Blue Hole. So it's really all together in one. It's called Tufa. And I thought I would show you some of the things that the Blue Hole is competing with. So in Ohio's vacation land, if any of you have ever been there, you might know there's all kinds of things that everybody associates with summer vacation. You can get ice cream, you can get taffy, you name it, right? It's a beach kind of place. And it starts out around the same time as the Blue Hole with um, kind of this Victorian, very, um, you know, kind of low-key attraction. But Cedar Point becomes quickly really the main attraction in this part of Ohio. And even early on, you can see they're developing huge big roller coasters and all kinds of carnival attractions. Honestly, this is where my brother wanted to go, right? Not the Blue Hole. <laughs> and of course, Cedar Point is still going. It continues to be built out. It's almost amazing that the Blue Hole lasted as long as it did with something like this as close by. But all was not lost. The Castalia Fishing Club, that was the owner of the Blue Hole, was not the only owner of a Blue Hole. They just owned the biggest. So in 1997, another private fishing club across town, along that same stream, sold their land to the state of Ohio to create a state fish hatchery. Now, this was quite controversial in Ohio at the time. They paid a million dollars for this hole in the ground that happened to have really cold water. Many taxpayers were not very happy about this. Are there any questions? The reading talks about how these holes opened up due to a dam being built, along with adding non-native fish and many walking paths and platforms. My question is what impact did this have on the local environment, if any? That's a great question. So in terms of the natural environment, it actually doesn't seem to have had a lot of negative impact. What it did have is a lot of positive impact on the economic environment for the people who lived in this area, and not just for the town of Castalia, but for the whole state. As I mentioned, it becomes the state fish hatchery. And in Ohio, that's a huge part of their business. So they spent not only the million dollars to buy the initial spot, but they invested another $7 million into this to make it a state-of-the-art fish hatchery to raise steelhead trout that supply the ponds and streams all over the state. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but as of 2013, Ohio's wildlife tourism business, which includes both fishing and hunting, was over $3 billion. So this little hole in the north part of Ohio is the source of all the steelhead trout all over the state, bringing people from not just Ohio, but all over. So they've upgraded. They've created kind of a, a channelized stream um, through to that new, I would say probably less picturesque hatchery building, right? It doesn't have the big water wheel anymore, but it still hatches the fish. And they have the concrete runways where the small fish can become um, bigger fish before they're, they're set out to, um, to their streams and ponds. But it does all start here with this apparently motionless, crystal clear water that's on view for a whole new generation to contemplate the bottomless hole, and the encrusted rock formations that capture your imagination. And you can still entertain the kids by feeding the fish. 
all for the price of a $3 box of Cheerios. I spent some time talking to this family and they said this is one of their, their all-time favorite things to do when they're on vacation. They make sure to come and feed the fish. So not only are, is this the state fish hatchery, but they are well fed before they are let out to be caught. But I couldn't feel as if I had gotten to the bottom of the story without going a little bit deeper. So in the 1980s, geologists shattered that mystery of the blue hole having no real bottom. They were able to map the entire Sandusky Basin, and they connected the Blue Hole to a show cave, Seneca Caverns, which is about 10 miles south of the Blue Hole. It's 110 feet below the surface and is often called the caviest of caves, which I think is kind of a great idea, uh, way of describing a cave, right? And, you know, in Virginia, we have our own show caves. They're not the caviest of caves because we have other things there. <laughs> if you all have been to Luray, you know what Luray Caverns is like, right? Um, Seneca does not have stalactites and stalagmites that make a natural organ. They don't have all of these spectacular things for you to see. Instead, what they have is that limestone. That same limestone that was so fragile that it broke apart in Castellia is underground here. And it has fractured and collapsed, and it creates a series of chambers that, that go all the way 110 feet down into the ground. You can go all the way to the bottom where the water starts on a hand-dug trail. At the very deepest level, level of this cave, the water seeps out of a very small fissure. But it eventually makes its way into cold streams and ponds that are filled at a rate of 7 million gallons a day at 48 degrees. So my quest finally came full circle and our journey ended at the beginning. When we got to sip the water from, as the postcard describes, the old mystery river. Now that was magical. But the true mystery was not that there was no bottom to the blue hole, nor that it was actually moved across town, because they really did move it. But the generations of road trippers from far and near stopped just to see clear blue-green water and imagine that they saw entire worlds in a few underwater rocks. So this is still my favorite place. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.